Um, yeah, so we're going to talk today about um, automated sampling and, and pulling. Like this is, you know, usually a lot of times I talk about analyzers, but this is me more about uh, taking manual samples, whether they're grab samples or composite samples. Some of the things we have to consider and some of the things we've done at Insight to try to make that process uh, easier, whether you're at a working gas plant, at a truckload or a rail offload situation or, or at a refinery. So, um, so we're going to talk about, like I say, automated sampling and composite sampling. Um, for those of you who've been on here before, uh, you know, I always like to mention a lot of our meetings in this industry start off with safety moments. And of course, those are important moments to have. The other thing I like to do at this point, because we've got so much going on in the world and in business and changes going on and Sometimes we think of everything that's going wrong. We got to realize what we should be grateful for. So I try to start these all off with a gratitude moment usually. And so this week, I want to send my gratitude out to all those guys who are working out in the oil patch up here in Canada. It is, we've had weathers that with wind chills have ranged from minus 40 to minus 55. And we have people out in the field trying to keep the heat on for all the people. So, you know, all that, uh, Energy is making its way into pipelines and making its way to our houses on behalf of uh, these guys who are working so hard out there. You can see it must have been really cool because my picture is really grainy because everything was wiggling as I was shivering. No, it's just a low res picture. But uh, anyways, I want to say a big thank you to the uh, oh, to those brave souls that are out there keeping our power on for us because uh, we've been having it's minus 30 here today in Calgary. And my guys, I got guys who are working up north this week. And it is, you know, minus 40. One of my instrument guys sent me a text with a picture of the local weather. And he said, it's only minus 43, but it feels like minus 51. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of know it's, it's tough work out there this time of year. Speaking of how cool it is, I always love expressions. Like you hear sometimes expressions like who let the cat out of the bag or whatever. And so one that I had to put in for this one was freezing the balls off a brass monkey because it's an expression that gets used out there. And you always wonder, where did it come from? And it came from all British men of warships. And they stored the cannonballs on a brass plate on the deck of the ship. And when it got really cold, the differential in expansion and contraction of the two metals would cause the cannonballs to fall off. And they called the brass plate that they set on the brass monkey. So freezing the balls off a brass monkey does not mean what a lot of us think it means. With that, we get on to something a little bit more relevant. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, a couple slides, and then I'm going to talk about automated grab sampling, spot or grab sampling, and then about composite sampling, taking a sample over a period of time or over a certain set of flow conditions. Insights, a Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor. We have about a 20,000 square foot shop up in the northeast of Calgary. Full 10 ton overhead crane can lift in a whole analyzer building off the back of a flatbed. Uh, nine bay doors, easily accessible. We love doing systems integration work. We're an AB3 uh, compliant fabricator. So for the Canadians, there's a thing called CRN number. And if anything's going to hold pressure, it has to have a CRN number. And basically, our shop is equipped to provide everything that we do with full CRNs. A lot of the people that are here with me um, have worked with me at previous jobs, and I've kind of handpicked them along the way. So we have really great engineering staff, manufacturing engineer, document control capabilities. My draftsman has been with, I've been working with my draftsman for almost 30 years now. Um, he's done analyzers and analyzer building drafting pretty much all of his life. All of our electricians are full journeymen. We do full factory acceptance tests right up here in Calgary. On the systems integration side, we'll do everything from small custom sample systems to process analyzer integration to full analyzer buildings. Some of you probably know me from teaching the um, Swedjar courses on uh, sample system design, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on being pretty good at analyzer sample systems and teaching other people how to do it. We'll take on projects uh, right from the feed stage uh, through to detail engineering design. We're doing feed projects now for a refinery for one of the pipeline companies up here, just looking at one for a big new uh, 
uh, waste energy company. We'll do full system fabrication and commissioning. And of course, one of the big things for us is service. Service is our largest and our fastest growing department. Okay, so we're gonna talk a bit about sampling now. First things to understand is why we concern ourselves with how samples get taken or what happens in that grab sampling process. If someone's gonna go out and pull a sample. What we, everybody usually worries about how are we gonna analyze it? What are we gonna do over at the lab? How's the lab, what's, what met, test method are we gonna use? How are we gonna determine what's in there? What we don't think about all the time is how are we actually gonna get that sample? Because how we actually extract the sample store the sample, get it to the lab, document what was done with the sample. Those are big issues for us. And if they're not done well, the whole point of getting that sample um, is lost. So some of the biggest errors that happen are actually from how the sampling has been done. Samples get taken from the wrong place. They get taken at the wrong time. They get taken not following the proper procedures. And the result is we get information that's no longer representative of our process and is not useful for its desired task. So we wanna think about how can we make this process of getting samples better and easier. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is this idea of getting grab samples or spot samples. So we often still pull the samples out in the field, even though online analyzers are proliferated, we're using more and more online analyzers to do measurements. Oftentimes our compliance agreements, custody transfer agreements are built around grab samples and lab methods. They have a long history to them. ASTF M methods have been around for many decades. It's been the common practice of how we communicate with each other to say, look, I wanna see if your product's on spec, you want to prove to me that your product's on spec. And so let's use a lab to do the analysis and come to that agreement. So grab sampling is still a really common method of ensuring compliance. The issue that we said though, is that sometimes samples get pulled from the wrong place. They get pulled at the wrong time. They don't get pulled by the right procedures. And so by automating grab sample panels, we can design them to capture samples according to that best practice. If we know exactly the procedure of how to best pull a sample, we can start to program that whole uh, procedure into a PLC and have the PLC control the whole set of operations. This allows that sampling process to be triggered remotely. So it means that I don't necessarily always have to have a person on site when I need to pull a sample. If you've ever been in an operating refinery, some of the technicians, not part of their rounds, is to go pull samples. And so a guy is supposed to pull a 2 a.m. sample from the debutinizer. Well, he's walking by it at one o'clock in the morning and he goes, oh, I'll pull my 2 a.m. sample right now. Marks it down as his 2 a.m. sample. Later when the results come back, they go, well, that's nothing like what the process was operating like at 2 a.m. Because he didn't actually create down the time you really pulled the sample out. So by being able to trigger it remotely, we can control from a control room, when do we get our sample, have it documented there, but also if we're using a PLC as part of this thing, that PLC now records exactly when and the operating conditions under which that sample got pulled. So this allows us to make sure that we pull samples the same way every time and we reduce our needs to, uh, to physically um, handle those samples. We don't have to send a person out there to do it all the time. We can make those, uh, make sampling panels, you know, be just a single spot sample, be multiple sample, use multiple different ways of triggering it, whether we trigger it from a local connection from something remotely. Um, again, we date and time log everything with the PLC put that whole automation piece behind it, we can interface it to an online analyzer. So some of our analyzers like near-infrared analyzers, uh, Raman analyzers, process NanoMAR analyzers, they all want samples to be pulled to try to build a model. Even if there's a situation where the control room thinks, I don't think the analyzer is reading right right now, correctly right now, right, right doesn't sound right. Um, 
if it's not reading correctly right now, we can trigger it from the control room and say, I want a sample right now. I want to get that to the lab and see if that analyzer is reading okay. So the types of samples we consider when we're talking about automating sampling are two. I'm going to talk about them both today. Grabber spot samples, where we collect all the material at once. These are commonly used when we want to see what the performance of our facility is at that point in time, or if we want to check to see if our analyzers are reading correctly. Um, but these samples only reflect what's going on in the process at exactly that moment in time that they were pulled. The other approach is to take something like a composite sample. Fill up a vessel by taking multiple small samples over a period of time, accumulating those, and then analyzing the stuff that averaged out in the vessel. Average the things, uh, all the process out over a period of time or over a certain amount of flow rate, and then say, well, now on average, what did we see? They tell us the performance of our facility over an extended period of time. These are often part of a custody transfer agreement. If someone's running a plant and they're selling crude oil into my pipeline, I might put a sample in there that averages what they produce over the course of a week and say, over the course of the week, the value of your product was this based on its chemical composition and physical properties. But I want to know that not just take one instantaneous sample. If I take one instantaneous sample, if Chris is running the plant and he knows I come out and take my sample on Tuesday mornings to see what his product's worth, he makes the best product he can on Tuesday morning because he wants to get the most value. By using a composite, we get to average out their fluctuations over time. So when we talk about spot sampling, um, you know, we're doing this to find out what the facility is doing at a known time and under known operating conditions. Maybe use like we say with inferential analyzers to help build models, or it might just be, or let's see if we're really put it, building an on-spec product, or we just want to validate an existing analyzer. Multiple reasons to take them, but regardless of what reason we're putting behind taking that sample, we're using it to figure out are we running at the right operating conditions, if we're using it to build models, if we're using it to see if we're on spec, if we're trying to validate an online analyzer with it, we have to make sure we pull the good sample. If we didn't pull a proper representative sample that really provides information in the process, all the effort in going out to do it was for naught. So the issues are often that Someone doesn't follow the right procedure. So with things, especially with volatile samples, things are likely to bubble when we sample them. If someone doesn't follow the right procedure when they're pulling that sample, we end up with the sample bubbling, foaming, frothing, losing a lot of the material that we might be interested in. A little video on the right here, I think this should play, um, that, uh, so I think from SPL Labs, and let me see, do I have to click on it over here? Hmm. Weird. Let's see if I can get it to play. Come on, play for me. Nope, doesn't want to play. Not playing happy. Anyways, when they pour it into this vessel, it um, starts to bubble and foam. So as soon as they pour it in the other vessel, once a bubble and foam happens, they've destroyed the, con the, the integrity of the sample. Some things have escaped and left. We want to know the date, time, and locations, what pressures and temperatures we were at, what operating conditions. Um, one of the other issues might be we want to sample during the middle of the night. Well, there's nobody at the plant to go pull the sample. Or the plant's an upset. I'd love a guy to go pull a sample right now, but he's trying to deal with all the things that are causing the plant to be an upset. So sometimes I just can't get the samples when I'd really like them. Or if we're running an analyzer and the analyzer says, you have off spec product, we might want to put a sample of that into a vessel because in that custody transfer agreement, when I try to tell Chris the product he's selling me is off spec, he's going to say, well, your analyzer was reading wrong. I say, well, I got a sample while my analyzer said you were off spec. Let's see what the sample says. The other issues are, of course, just human error, people making mistakes as they do it. They know the right procedure, but don't do it. Um, and then there's also issues with safety and exposure. Um, 
we were talking to some people about how, you know, they had issues with some of their folks pulling samples of propane because it boils and flashes so easy and gets really cold. They don't close a valve properly or do something properly, disconnect at the wrong time. They end up with this fluid getting on them, right? And of course, you know, in our industry, we also work with things like H2S or HF. And so these are samples we have to be really careful from, from a toxicity reason. So if we can automate a lot of these things, we save ourselves from that personal exposure risk sometimes. When we're talking about sampling volatile things, things that bubble and boil easily, there's two common approaches. The thing we usually wanna do is try to keep this material in a single phase. So we wanna keep it under pressure the whole time we're sampling. So the two common approaches that get used are to use what's called a floating piston cylinder. Some people also call them a constant pressure cylinder. And in those devices, I'm gonna show one on the next page, but there's a piston that can move in a cylinder and it's kept back pressured with something like nitrogen or helium. And then we slowly bleed off the back pressure and let the fluid push the piston down. And that way the fluid always stays under pressure, stays under the pressure of whatever our nitrogen bleed is at. The other way to do it is with glycol. Up here we use glycol because it gets to be minus 40. Um, you can do it in places in the US or in Central America, you know, they'll do it with just water back uh, fills, but you fill the cylinder up with one liquid and use the pressure of the other liquid to push whatever you fill the cylinder with out. And again, it keeps the other, the liquid that you're filling with always under pressure. And we've automated both of these types of ways of taking volatile samples. So in this top panel here, um, we've got four floating piston cylinders sitting there. So this is a floating piston cylinder panel, and this is a glycol displacement. A little bit harder, it's glycol. There's two cylinders down here for the glycol displacement side of things. And I talk a bit about how those both work. In the floating piston cylinder approach, we have this piston that you can see right here that can move back and forth in the cylinder. We have an inlet slide where we can bring in the fluid we want to sample. And on this side, we've pressurized it with something like nitrogen or a ga any gas. And so when we want to fill the cylinder, what we can do, and we show that down here as well with a little mixing paddle in it, but what we do is the fluid that we want to sample is under pressure on the inlet side. We keep the nitrogen pressure higher than the fluid pressure and nothing can go in the cylinder. Then we start to bleed off the nitrogen, slowly lower that nitrogen pressure. As the pressure drops, as soon as it gets less than the inlet pressure, then the inlet starts to push the piston back. So now we can fill the vessel while keeping the inlet fluid always at the same pressure as it is in the pipeline. So this allows us to ensure that that material, assuming it was single phase in the pipeline, stays single phase when it goes into the cylinder. So this is especially important for you know, what the US would call Y grade, uh, other people might call LPG, liquefied petroleum gases, but things like propanes and butanes, condensates, natural gas condensate has a lot of butane in it, typically that's the volatile, uh, high vapor pressure crude oils. So if you're pulling a sample off a pipeline in the US, I've got a nine and a half pound vapor pressure spec. So you want to make sure when you pull the sample, you don't let bubbles come out because that's going to change your vapor pressure. So you have to make sure you pull these samples uh, in a way that doesn't allow any of the gas to escape. And that's the whole point of these types of cylinders. And this is all covered off in an ASTM standard ASTM D3700. The other way of pulling these kinds of samples is to use a standard type sample cylinder and Connect it up to the fluid that we're interested in. Ideally, I would have shown a bit more detail up here. 
there's pr probably an automated valve right here if we're doing this as an automated system. The process to sample, this might be my oil and it's under pressure. And what I can do is I open the valve that allows fluid to come and press on the cylinder. Now the whole cylinder that's filled with a liquid like glycol or water is under pressure. So that blue part is my glycol that's in there. Once I open the valve at the top, the sample pressure is pushing on the glycol, but it's got no place to go. So now the glycol is pressurized to the same pressure as the pipeline it's connected to is. Then I open this needle valve at the bottom and I start to let liquids drip out of it. Let that, that glycol that's in there can now start to flow out. As it starts to, as the fluid above it presses on that glycol, it pushes liquid out the needle valve, slowly filling the cylinder with the oil sample or whatever it is that I want to sample. All the time, there's no headspace available. So no bubbles get lost during this. This whole thing is done filling that cylinder under pressure. We typically fill it to about 80%. Bleed off a little bit of the extra glycol, which creates a headspace, and you think, well, that must cause a problem, but it doesn't because we keep that headspace with the crude or the or the condensate or the LPG that's in there. And when we get it to the lab, we repressurize it and push any bubbles that were created back into the liquid. We bleed it out to about 80%. Um, oops. Because it makes it safe to transport. Um, if we don't give these things a little bit of headspace, then when the liquid expands, it can actually rupture the vessel. That's why there's a relief valve on the sides of these. But we don't want that relief valve to pop. Then we lose things from our sample. Now we can take those and put that whole thing now under PLC control. So here we show just two, there's no cylinders there, but there's two spots to put cylinders on this panel. PLC beside it, a little touch screen display. And now with the PLC, we can control all the information that you're interested in. Configurable stream data, live process data, like temperatures and pressure, so we can see what the process is doing. If there's an analyzer there, we can bring its data back over at Modbus, make it available on the PLC so you get to see how everything's running. Any alarm details, any, well, if we want to see the analyzer results, you know, whether what status we're in, operate maintenance, we can enter things like serial cylinder numbers. So again, it's all about trying to get that good chain of custody information. We want to track where did the cylinder come from? Which one got filled? What time did it get filled out? Um, all the capabilities to interact with that are programmed into the PLC. So we'll give you examples of some of the sort of screens that will be put together. So if we're looking at something for, um, you know, controlling just, uh, oh, I didn't change the text on this slide. Put a different picture there with no text. Oops. Um, we'll put in all the things about identifying which cylinder we're going to put in there. So again, like we might have, we know which one is, we've identified two cylinders. One is cylinder A, one is cylinder B. We'll show a status to tell you which ones are full, which ones are ready to be filled. We'll show you information like the cylinder serial numbers. So again, if someone's trying to keep records of which cylinder got filled at one time, well, I want to know what cylinder number was it. So I can put all that data in, we little easy to use um, information screens just to fill in all the information about what kind of sample am I taking. Then the PLC also knows things like, because if you go to the lab, the lab will also want, often ask you, well, under what conditions did you fill the cylinder? So again, you know, coming back into the PLC, temperatures and pressures of flow. If we have analyzer results, it's telling us here that it's one volume percent C3, has a vapor pressure of 240 kPa. The transmission on this uh, particular analyzer is 50% transmission to light. Tells us our flow rate that's going through the panel. So we have all the information that we need to know, is it flowing? Should I pull a sample now? And of course, date and time stamp so we know when it's gonna get pulled. We can trigger that cylinder manually just by pressing that um, button at the bottom, or 
we can have a remote signal come in that might say, it looks like we're selling off spec product right now, according to the analyzer, take a sample, fill the cylinder. Or we look like someone's sending us, we're offloading a truck and that truck's got product that we actually don't wanna have coming into our facility, stop the load, fill the cylinder so we can take it to the lab. So we have all this control about how the cylinder gets filled as well. You know, you see it pulls, puts up a full little chain of custody report up here. Um, allows us to record all of that information that was being present on the display and generate that report directly out of the PLC. We can have different permissives coming into the PLC, like if there's not a truck in the truck bay, nobody is allowed to trigger a cylinder being filled because there's nothing there to fill up from, or if there's not sufficient flow rate, or if the temperatures aren't correct. Um, so we can put a bunch of logic behind this that prevents us from pulling samples when we don't want to, and ensures that we know everything we need to know about when we did pull the sample. If there's floating piston cylinders there, they're only supposed to be filled to 80% as, as well. So we add in a piston position sensing capability. So what we have typically on our floating piston systems is uh, two magnetic sensors. One that says the piston is right at the top of the vessel. It's never been filled yet. And the second one says it's 80% full. So it's empty. It's 80% full. So this allows us to set up our logic quite simply. Remember, this is back pressured with gas. So now we say, well, open the valve at the bottom. Again, this is, there's actually another, there's another actuated valve on the actual panel. This valve is left open. We open the actuated valve. That lets us start to bleed off pressure from the cylinder. If the pressure is still higher than the process pressure, if this pressure is higher, nothing goes in. As the nitrogen bleeds off, the pressure on the back side of the cylinder gets reduced and it allows the process pressure to start pushing in and pushing the piston down. So we sense when the piston leaves the zero position. We know about how long it should take to fill the cylinder. We wait and we watch for it to hit that 80% position and says it's appropriately full, close the valve and stop bleeding off any more nitrogen. So again, it allows us to ensure that we always fill these cylinders to the right amount. We put complete diagnostics around it. You can look at all the history. We can pull in, you know, in this case, it's interfaced also with a spectrometer. So we have, you know, things like spectrometer failure in there, Modbus faults, have all the data communication faults, make this fully interactive with the people who are using it. Because again, what we want to do is make this simple for people to use. They understand how it works. And all they have to do now is check to see if they've got a fault. In this case, a person looks at the panel and says, oh, we've got a low flow fault. Wonder why we got low flow. I should go and check some meters, check operating pressures, look for something that's plugged, et cetera. So we can bring all that data, any sensors into that PLC. As we mentioned, we get the full chain of custody. Um, we get all the data records for every fill so we can go back historically, check on different cylinders. When was that cylinder last used? When was it filled? What results did we get? Um, we can send these off to a lab now with confidence that the sample was pulled according to the proper procedure. If we're using this with an analyzer like a, a process infrared analyzer that we want data build models, we can integrate this directly into the analyzer, set flags to the analyzer to say, we just pulled a sample right now. Whatever spectrum you're seeing, it corresponds to cylinder XYZ. So now we can use this to improve our modeling processes as well. So this is especially important, you know, in places like refineries, right? Where you'll often see things like near infrared analyzers in there. A lot of NIR, a lot of Raman analyzers all based on modeling. This lets us do a better job of the modeling. Typical applications that we'll see will be, uh, like we mentioned, in refineries, 
off the various different trays of the distillation towers, we get different products coming off. And each one of those products, we may want to be able to take a sample. So we can look at what's coming off the condensate reflux side, looking what's going off to the vapor overhead side, looking what's coming off on different parts of the tower. And without having to go out there, fill sample cylinders and say, okay, just go out, pick up all the cylinders that are available, take them to the lab. Truck and rail loading and offloading. Base, we have a client who said, I bring in propane, I bring in butane, I bring in high quality um, chemical plant type propane, different products and I put them into different caverns. I wanna be able to take a sample off of every truck without having a guy out there to always pull samples off of trucks. So I can trigger a sample off of any truck that comes in. You know, these will often have multiple loading bays. I'll say whatever trucks coming in or going out, I can decide I need a sample from that truck. We have a flow system that just, because it's offloading the truck, so I need a sample, fills a cylinder. During any kind of blending operations, we often want to be able to pull samples. And so we can use these to pull samples of volatile samples, where, uh, liquids, things that might bubble. Um, difficult samples, things that we're worried about toxicity. You know, so re lean and rich amine. We always worry about H2S and these. Same with glycol. So if we're going to pull samples in a plant off of a, an amine separator fluid, well, we want to make sure that there are people exposed to it. So if we can automate that process, put gas detection out by where it is, and now when a person goes out to pull a sample, as long as the gas detection says it's okay, we know nothing's leaking, and it's safe for him to take that sample out. We can also sample difficult uh, samples like um, bitumens and raffinates, things off the bottom of vacuum distillation units or diluted bitumen up here in Alberta. Things that are heavy and viscous and we have to keep hot. Again, difficult samples to handle. Nice if we can put an automated system around that, that when the person that goes out to sample it doesn't have to go through all these valve changes, do things in the right order, while he's worried about having this uh, high temperature product right by him. And as we said, it works with any type of inferential analyzer. So these, again, this is what we use when we're doing things like spot or grab samples. But we also have a different type of system that we use, especially for volatile liquids um, for composite sampling. So I'm gonna talk a bit about composite sampling as well. Composite samples are acquired over time. <clears throat> it may be done over a, on a time proportional basis. I'm gonna put a sample into my cylinder every 15 minutes, or it may be done on a flow proportional basis. Every 10 barrels of oil that goes by, I wanna take a sample and put it into my cylinder. And then over the course of a day or a week or a month, I get all these little samples that have been put in the cylinder and they represent the average of that fluid over time. One of the advantages of composite sampling is if we were to just go out and pull one sample, and say, well, that's gonna represent what my product's like this month. Obviously it could be off spec that day and we're assuming now the whole month's off spec. Even if we go out and pull 10 individual samples and then we measure them individually, now they have to go to the lab 10 times, 10 lab results. We hope all those results are good and then we have to try to take the average of those. So that looking at the average of all the individuals often has more noise and discrepancy in it than if we take all the samples and mix them together. So the example I'm trying to give here is if I'm weighing little one gram wafers of gold. If my scale is only accurate to one milligram, every one of those uh, measurements I make has error in it. But if I take 10 of them and put them all on the scale at once, I can say, well, I weighed 10 of them. The 10 of them weighed 9.9856 grams, Divide it by 10, on average, they weigh 0.99856. And I can get better accuracy typically on those sorts of measurements. In this case, it just worked out that the average of the individual measurements had around 0.015% error, and the average of putting 10 of them on the scale had only 0.02% error. 
I mean, well, that doesn't seem like a very big difference. If you're putting a million barrels of oil through your pipeline a day, small errors in those big numbers adds up to a lot of money, right? 1% error on a million barrels is a thousand barrels of oil. At 55 bucks a barrel, it's $55,000. So that 1% you know, error is a big number. So this composite sampling lets us average things over time, look at the properties over time and say, was my product meeting specification? Did I hit my rate numbers? And also what was the value of my product? The lab may say, well, if your vapor pressure is too high, we're not gonna pay you as much. Or if there's more sulfur in your crude, we're not gonna pay you as much. So now we gotta go, well, I'll take an average of all the crude I produced over the last month and build the value proposition around that average. Um, in Canada here, we have something called the Industry Measurement Group. They've been looking at um, how, what our best practices are for composite sampling. There's uh, members of a number of the big oil companies, uh, producers on here. Pamela Pipelines is on the committee, Kiera, Secure, CNRL. Um, so it's of great interest. These people want to make sure that whole custody transfer thing, the government wants to know too, because the government taxes all of these products. So everybody wants to know how valuable these things are. We're going to send a copy of these slides out afterwards. And so I wanted to put in there, there's two very relevant documents. Uh, the API section 8.2 is um, petroleum measurement standard, specifically related to automated sampling and composite sampling. And for you people here in Alberta, it's AAR Directive 17, Chapter 14. So the way a composite sampler works is Kind of shown here, this is a simple version, um, which would potentially have a couple of issues, but it kind of shows the idea pretty well. We have a pipeline and it's got some flow going past it. Let's see, this is oil. The flow goes past the sample quill and above the sample quill, there's located a little pump here. And this pump is capable of pulling really small samples. Let's assume it's about one milliliter per stroke. So we can actuate this pump and every time we actuate it, it says, I'm gonna pump out a milliliter. So and it pumps it out this way. So these are often air, there are um, electric ones, but common you see these being pneumatically actuated. So these are often air actuated. And so someplace remotely, there's a controller that's opening a valve to say, I'm gonna pop that valve open, tell that pump to take a shot. It might be opening that valve based on time, like I said, or on the amount of flow that's gone by, but it tells the valve pump to take a shot. The pump pushes one milliliter of fluid over to this big vessel it's gonna fill up as an accumulator. So what it's doing is every time a the pump tells it, or the controller tells it to, takes a small sample of that fluid, pushes it into the accumulator vessel. The accumulator vessel then fills up slowly over time. Talk about this accumulator vessel in a minute, but it's one of those floating piston types and it keeps some back pressure on it all the time. So the fluid that goes in there stays in the proper phase. Now, some of the issues can be, if this line is made really long, well, that one milliliter that just got out of the pump, it didn't get over into the vessel right away. And that whole line was full of old fluid for a long time. Also, sometimes people mount this pump remotely and they don't have continuous flow by it. Or if there's a lot of volume up down here, they don't get a good representative measurement. So how the system's set up, that's why I kind of say it's a bit of a simplified system, but it shows kind of the concepts of what's going on. When we put together a composite sampler, it usually ends up going out looking something like this one. Um, we do customize these based on client requirements, um, but all the major components are kind of listed on there. We end up with this large accumulator vessel. So this is where our sample builds up. This is the accumulator. So we're gonna pump that and fill that up. On top of that, you see this tall uh, 
cylinder sitting up here. There's just a side indicator. See, let's let you know how full is the vessel so far. There's also a level transmitter. We'll talk about why there's a level transmitter there in a minute. Turned out that this particular level transmitter needed an IS barrier, so this junction box is here. We don't usually do that anymore. It just uses up more space. Pressure, so we know what pressure our system's at. On the side over here, we've got another floating piston cylinder. This guy's too big to take to the lab. So we gotta be able to take a, we accumulate a 15 liter sample over a period of time, and then we mix that up and we push it into a smaller cylinder to take it over to the lab. There's a lot of, these are often put in to be used under manual operations. So there'll be certain processes and procedures that people have to go through in order to properly pull a sample off of here or to set the cylinder up. And so first, you know, we make sure that we put those, oops, sorry, I meant to be, stay on Zoom there. We put those full operating procedures right on the back of the panel right there where if there's any manual valves that people are gonna, manual operations people are gonna have to do, we give them a procedure that's right there built onto the device. Below that, we make sure we do things like color code valve handles so that we can make that procedure as easy to follow as possible. Instead of having to look at tags all the time and go, okay, which valve is RB1? Well, it happens to be the red valve with the round handle. So the procedure will refer to it by color and handle shapes. So we just make it easy for operators to be able to grab the right handle and do the right things. Main pieces that are on there are the accumulator vessel we talked about. Precharge vessel for this one is sitting in the back on the back of it. Level transmitter, lab grab sample cyst cylinder, that color coded operational valve assembly. And then there's usually there's the injection pump, which in this case was put on the outside of the building that this went inside of. Of course, everything starts with getting a good sample. So first thing we have to consider is where are we gonna sample from in the post process pipe? Is it gonna be well mixed there? So probably we wanna be five to eight pipe diameters downstream from some kind of a static mixer. We want to be sure that that sample's been well mixed. Especially important, we're trying to do things like water and oil. If there's water and crude oil, water wants to settle at the bottom. So we're going to make sure it mixes into the oil if we're going to try to get a representative water and oil sample. We then will often put a probe in, unlike our analyzer probes. Analyzer probes, we almost always make the nozzle or the entrance of the probe. This is my probe entrance here. With analyzers, Oops. We usually have our probe facing away from the, the entrance of our probe facing away from the direction of flow. When we're trying to do things for grab sampling, we often put our entrance to our probe facing the direction of flow because we want to sample for things like sediment and water. In our process analyzers, we don't want dirt getting into them. Composite samplers, if we want to do a BS and W and crude oil, We've got to be facing the direction of flow. Then ideally, we make this be an isokinetic flow loop. We flow through the probe at the same speed, at the same velocity as the things are moving along the pipeline. This allows us to get us the get the best representative sample. So when the system is normally running, nothing interesting is happening. We have a sample of processed fluid, whatever it is, our crude oil flowing out, flowing past the pump head and being piped, pumped and probably returned back to process by another pump. We can make this automated loop. We can make this fast loop work also with a custom design probe. So HP is on here. There's a, uh, a flow impact pipe probe. Inside has a version of this probe that has a port that faces process. See Mark's on here and he's got one of our probes out of his plant right now and testing it out. So um, 
we can make a probe that gives you continuous flow past that pump all the time. Make sure there's always a fresh sample there. But what we want to have, this piece of the system during normal operation, the key is to make sure that we have fresh samples sitting there right at the pump head all the time. When that pump strokes, we want to know it's got sample that just came out of the process. If it's put remote from the process and there's not some way of creating this fast loop, then what it's pulling is what's in the line. And this line might have, depending on the tubing it's uh, made out of, it may be as 50 milliliters to a couple of hundred milliliters of volume. If the pump only strokes one milliliter and it only strokes every 15 minutes, it can take hours or days to clear the lines out. So we need that fast loop flowing past the pump head to allow us to be confident we're pumping the right material to the accumulator. So then we have a sample pump up there. One we're showing here is a YZ pump. We want that close to where the accumulator is gonna be. So in this case, that fast loop would be flowing right down through that T at the bottom. So that's keeping fresh material right at the entrance of that pump. The pump has the capability of adjusting how big the injection volume is. And so how much we'll get per stroke, half a milliliter, one milliliter, three milliliters. API 8.2 says you should try to use 10,000 strokes to fill your vessel. So once you know your vessel size, you can figure out what stroke size you want. Every time a pneumatic signal comes in onto the head of that pump, pneumatics come in and it pushes a small sample out through the pump and past this check valve and pushes it over to the accumulator. So we want to keep that volume fairly small. Goes over to the accumulator vessel. Accumulator vessel looks like this. Um, This is the main, I'm gonna just change my pen, this will be easier. This is my floating piston. So crude is coming in here, or my sample. The pump pushes a bit of sample in here. That increases the amount of liquid in here, which pushes on the piston. The piston is backfilled with nitrogen. And when the liquid comes in, it pushes some nitrogen out that port. So it always stays at whatever pressure the nitrogen is. So the piston is always kept under pressure. We can control what pressure it's at by controlling the pressure of the nitrogen there. The pump's able to overcome that pressure. So it pushes, the liquid's not compressible, pushes the piston back, pushes a bit of nitrogen out, allows some uh, liquid to come in. These usually have a device in here that I refer to as the French press. It looks kind of like a coffee press. Um, and there's another piston up here and it's able to plunge that French press up and down. So before I want to take a sample of it, I want to make it mixed, make sure it's mixed. So I have a capability to operate that plunger and mix everything that's in there before I pull a sample out for the lab. So when we are going to do an accumulator fill, if we want to send a shot to the accumulator, what happens is the control system actuates the valve. So these blue lines up here are showing air that's coming over the pump. Actuates the valve, that hits the pump. Pump says, push a shot out. So what it does is it takes a sample. Remember, we've had this fast loop running the whole time. Now the pumps have fresh material there and it's told, okay, push that material, push one milliliter of that material over the vessel. You'll usually see on the drawings, there's this little symbol there that says, keep that line sloping down. We want those lines to slope down. So if we wanna do water and crude or water and condensate, if we create a low spot, the water is gonna build up there. So we wanna keep the lines, have a nice continuous slope over to the accumulator. We keep that process going every 10 barrels that goes by or whatever it is, 
push a, stro push a stroke towards the accumulator, fill the accumulator up over a period of time, typically to 80%. And there may be different periods of time. We have one, uh, we do ship loading for uh, propane. So come, one of our clients sells propane over to Japan. You have a terminal, push propane onto the ship. Oh, it takes about three days to fill a ship. They fill up an accumulator vessel over the three days, check the quality of the product in the accumulator. Say so that's the average of what we put on the ship. Products on spec, it's okay to ship. So ship loading, these might fill over three days. Uh, oil pipeline or a condensate pipeline, they're all, they often do it over one month. They basically look at the average product over the month and say, so what your product was worth to us. But it does that by doing these little small one or two milliliter shots into the accumulator vessel and then filling that up over a period of time. We want a level transmitter on that vessel because we want to know, is the piston moving? Every time I put a one milliliter shot in, I know how much the piston should move. If I put 3,000 shots into the cylinder, there should be three liters there, and I know where the piston should be. And I want to see if that piston's moving because it lets me know if my pump's actually pushing out the right stroke size. So this is a requirement of API 8.2. It says that you have to have some method of continuous level uh, measurement in a comparison to what should be there. Once the accumulator is full, we're gonna to wanna to take a sample out of it that we can take over to the lab. So we wanna make sure that the accumulator is thoroughly mixed. So we do that by having this French press device that's in there. And you can see there's little black marks on the sides of the rod that goes through. So there's O-ring seals on those. And what we do is we, um, oops, that's not moving. What we do is in the upper part, connected to that rod is another piston. And we alternatingly pressurize one side or the other of that piston with air. So if I increase my pressure on the bottom side of the piston, it pushes the piston up. And then I increase my air on the top side of the piston and move it down. And that pushes the French press up and down, and that mixes the oil that's inside the vessel. So if it's stratified and denser stuff has gone to the bottom, I get it thoroughly mixed. I do that by changing the air, and I do that with just a simple uh, hand toggle. It's hard to see it right here. There's a little joystick at the bottom of that device. Two little breather ports that relieve the pressure. I just hand toggle it. So I don't have to have any electrical available to use this. Just hand toggle that, and that's going to move the mixer up and down, mix the whole vessel. Once I've done that, once I've got it mixed, I want to push it over to this is my cylinder I'm going to take to the lab. So I want to get it over into that cylinder. So again, this is where someone's going to have to adjust some valves. So we put these color-coded valve assembly there and we let people know, this is how you're gonna fill your cylinder for the lab. They typically take a one liter sample off of that vessel. The vessel is about 15 liters. Couple of pieces of the operation of that. When we first start to push fluid out of the accumulator, over here, I've got that accumulator. Well, there's a whole lot transfer line over here. I don't want all the stuff that's sitting in that line getting into my vessel I take to the lab. So I wanna make sure I can purge it first. So I increase the pressure on the backside of the piston on the accumulator, open a bypass valve, fluid flows out of the accumulator, purges the head of the cylinder, and then goes to bypass. Well, this makes, makes me, lets me make sure all the lines are clean, the head of the cylinder has been purged out, doesn't have any bubbles or anything in it, gets everything bled out, and then switch the valve and take the material that I'm pushing out of the cylinder, out of the accumulator, and push it directly into the vessel, pushing this piston, the inside 
uh, piston with a smaller floating piston cylinder back and filling the cylinder under pressure. Once we close that red bleed valve, nothing can be bled off and sample can be filled. So a couple of operation again that we just have to make sure to get done in the right order. And again, this is why we go with color-coded valves, detailed instructions. So what we provide then is a complete package solution to composite sampling for pipelines, ship loading, trail offloading uh, type applications. And again, the one we're talking about here, ones we're talking about here are specifically suited to things like LPGs, condensates, and crudes. If it's low vapor pressure products, things like heavy crude oil, bitumen, et cetera, we might do, we'll do these operations using some different bits of equipment, but this particular one is one that we've installed a number of through Canada, mostly on the condensate lines that run through Canada. That wraps me up on most of the tech stuff. I'm almost right on time, Chelsea. Well done. You didn't get to interrupt me or anything. Um, well, I'll mention just this will come out. You know, we carry a full line of products, everything from level transmitters. Um, we work a lot with Hawk on a lot of the level uh, type things. We have a partnership with Sulfur Experts for doing plant testing and plant optimization testing. Fiber optics for pipeline integrity uh, through Hawk as well. Next week, February, what is that? Today's the 11th, it must be February 18th. We're gonna do a presentation on water and hydrocarbon dew point analyzers for natural gas transmission. Um, total sulfur and liquids, total sulfur and gases, BTU content we spoke about last week. Many people know about us because of the JP3 things. That's one of the places we started this company from. Um, Perceptive has some really interesting capabilities both for tank level monitoring and for identification of fluids. They use a sound-based technology that can look right through the wall of a tank and basically say, this one's got LPG in it, or this one's got butane in it, this one has pentane in it. So they'll tell you what's in the tanks based on how sound transmits throughout. Um, numbers of other products there. Over the course of the next couple of months, we're gonna to try to do a webinar about all of these. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, always pleased that people can fit us into their schedule and make it to these. Uh, again, your gratitude goes out to those guys who are not as lucky as us to be sitting in front of a Zoom screen right now and instead are out trying to keep a plant out running someplace in this minus 40 degree weather that we have up north. So uh, again, it's the reason why all our hoses are warm is because those guys do their jobs. Next week, uh, we'll be doing uh, the Z-Gas Hydrocarbon Water Dew Point Analyzers. Thank you, Phil. Does anybody have any questions, guys? HP, good to see you, man. You should talk. Um, if you do have, oh, I do usually put this little slide of animations up, but we'll pass that. And just mention, if you need to contact somebody, uh, there's Scott's, uh, Chris's, and my email uh, address. Um, you'll probably be getting a copy of our line card with the email that goes out. And uh, I think our new website should be up probably next week. So thanks again for coming.